So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to new Eden uh, series of webinars, uh, our autumn initiative, Education in Time of New Normal. I'm very happy that we were able to start with this initiative after the spring one, which was very successful. And uh, just let me remind you that in the spring, we started with our Eden uh, webinar initiative, which was called Education in Time of uh, Pandemic. We had 11 webinars with uh, 35 speakers and moderators with more than 3,500 participants from all over the world. We started on the March 30th and lasted till the June 8th and also all recordings are available. Uh, high attendees, uh, high attendance of participants uh, showed us that it's important that such initiatives continue. And now, as we are in the autumn, hoping that pandemic will go away, but it hasn't, We've, we saw that now we have to continue and to be present as well. And to help teachers and university leaders to take next steps, how to ensure high quality teaching and learning in the situation we face today. Although we all thought that we will be able to go back to school, to universities, to classrooms, uh, still uh, the chance for that is not so high. This is the reason why many universities did decide to move fully online. Other universities, more traditional, decided for the blended mode of learning and some still hope that they will be able to have their students in the classroom. Um, this pandemic is just a catalyst for educational organization to implement online teaching and learning systematically, because before that, usually it was not so much uh, a strategic decision. And also what we have to think about now is that springtime, when we had the first round of COVID and lockdown of uh, schools, universities, but also of people staying at home, we had mostly re emergency remote teaching, which is not online education uh, in the full sense. And it was, I would say, uh, SOS uh, decision to save the academic year and to ensure continuity of teaching and learning. This was something which was good at that moment, but cannot be taken as a good example for the autumn. And now today, we start with our initiative with topics, online transformation of universities, having faced the challenge of the pandemic, are they prepared for the new normal? I think this is very, very important topic because university leaders have to reflect on what has been going on so far and how to continue. There are many aspects which have to be taken into account uh, from technical, organizational, pedagogical, uh, and so on. So today I'm very happy that I have speakers with me who are experts in this field. So I'm very happy that with us is Sir John Daniel, uh, Professor Blazin Kadiviak, and Professor Antonio Teixeira. Uh, I hope that during our webinar today, we will be able to provide you with some advices and maybe uh, insights into how to organize and how to manage a uh, situation in education today when we are not able to have things back to the time which were before the pandemic. I wouldn't say to the time which were normal before because we are talking a lot about normal and new normal and what does normal actually mean. Does, is it normal to have in 21st century only classroom teaching and learning? Uh, so there are lots of questions here, but we will try to reply on them uh, during our session. Let me present my speakers first. Sir John Daniel served for 17 years as the university president in Canada and UK at the Open University before joining UNESCO as Assistant Director General for Education in 2001 and moving back to Canada as President of Commonwealth of Learning from 2004 to 2012. 
He has been involved in the development of open and distance learning for 40 years. Knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1994 for services to higher education, he has received 32 honorary, honorary doctorates from universities in 17 countries. Best known as a scholar for his book, Mega Universities and Knowledge Media, Technology Strategies for Higher Education, the most recent of his 330 publications include Making Sense of MOOCs, Using in a Maze of Myth, Paradox and Possibility, and the Guide to Quality in Online Learning. And also, I'm very happy to say that he is former president of Eden, that he was uh, engaged in the establishment of Eden organization, and I'm very happy that he is very active Eden member still today. Thank you, Sir John and Daniel, for being with us today. Let me present my second speakers, and now I will go to ladies. Um, I'm very happy that I know Blazinka personally for quite a number of years. He was usually my boss, but uh, today, okay, we are colleagues. Uh, but I was very happy to work uh, with her uh, while she was saying what I have to do. So, Professor Blazinka Divyak was Croatian Minister of Science and Education from June 2017 to July 2020, so basically a month ago almost. She was leading four major reform processes since then. Curricular reform of general education, reform of vocational education and training, enhancements of, enhancement of relevance of higher education, and excellence of research. She was chairing European Union Council of Ministers for Education and Council of Ministers for Research and Space during Croatian presidency. You all know that Croatia was sharing uh, this in the first part of 2020, and we are not guilty for having COVID during our presidency. In that period, she led the process of adopting several council conclusions, future teachers, future jobs, brain circulation, and so on, as well as coordinating the European Union response to COVID-19 crisis in education and research. She holds PhD in mathematics from the University of Zagreb Faculty of Science and Mathematics, and she's full professor at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Organization and Informatics. She served as vice rector for students and study programs at the University of Zagreb in time of 2020 to 2014. She is author of over 100 scientific and professional papers in field of mathematics, strategic planning in higher education and research, mathematical education, project management, higher education reform, curriculum development, learning analytics, e-learning, and science communication. So I'm certain that you will all agree that she's more than, uh, uh, than expert in this field, and I'm very happy that she has joined us today to be with us. And last but not least, my dear colleague, Antonio Teixeira, also Eden, former Eden president, who was also, who is associate professor of open distance and network education at Universidade Aberta in Portugal. He's also a researcher at the University of Lisbon and collaborates with the University of Rome III. He was pro-rector for information in distance learning at Universidade Aberta from 2006 to 2009 and president of Eden from 2013 to 2016. As a prorector at Universidad de Aberta, he conceived and managed the successful and speedy strategic transformation process of, process of the university from a print-based distance learning institutions to fully online one. Throughout the years, he has integrated several boards of directors and many expert committees and task forces in higher education institutions and organizations at national and international level. He's currently an external expert at AQU Catalonia, Agency for Quality uh, Assurance in Catalonia, and also uh, ACPUA, Quality Assurance Agency in Spain, and the Research and Innovation National Agency of Uruguay, Ur Uruguay I'm sorry, among others. Antonio has also participated in over 30 international research projects and authored one over 100 scientific articles and other publications. He is also Eden Senior Fellow and member of the Board of Council of Eden Fellows. And I'm very happy that also he is the host of Eden Research Workshop, which is going to be now in autumn. And before uh, going to my speakers for introductionary presentation, 
Uh, these are the questions you have all seen at our Eden Web, which are going to be discussed today. You can see that there are a number of issues which we found important and would like to talk about. And I hope that you will all get some ideas uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, insights after the session on how to proceed with uh, uh, education in high, uh, with organization of education in higher education. And also, as I said, Antonio is going to host our Eden Research Workshop, which is going to be from October 21st to 23rd. Planned to be in Lisbon, but uh, eventually being online. Call for, for papers is open, so please join and contribute because I think now in this time, re research is very important. And based on our research, we can have good teaching uh, and learning methods which we can apply in education. So I will stop with sharing of my screen. And now I would like to ask Sir John Daniel to give his introductory presentation uh, in our session. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. It's uh, a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, where it is only eight o'clock in the morning and it's almost still dark because uh, the city has been invaded by the fires that have been, the smoke from the fires that have been burning in the states uh, south of us. So it's a very peculiar atmosphere, but it's a pleasure to be with you. And um, I, uh, was a founder, as, as uh, Sandra said, I was founder of uh, Eden back in the early 90s. But since then, for the last 15 years, I've been living in Canada. So I haven't been able to participate as much as I would have liked in Eden activities. And it's a pleasure to be doing so again. So my title today is Online and Distance Learning, What Do Students Need to Succeed? And as you've implied, when COVID-19 erupted in the early months of 2020, higher education institutions had to vacate their campuses and go online in a very short time. Now, most teachers thought that they coped surprisingly well with this challenge, although I think the students were divided between those who were more or less satisfied and those who felt that they were getting a substandard product. Meanwhile, the pandemic has spread uh, and its evolution varies widely around the world. Some jurisdictions appear to have got it under control. Others this week indeed are seeing new waves of infection when they thought they'd got it under control. And in some large population countries, notably Brazil, India and the United States, they've lost control of the virus such that the number of cases worldwide may soon reach 30 million. And this makes it very difficult for higher education institutions to plan for the future. They cannot know when and how the pandemic will end, nor what legacy it will leave behind. Will all HEIs make regular use of online learning, or will most of them return in some cases, I'm sure very happily to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Only time will tell. Today, I'm going to make three assumptions. First, that higher education institutions need to develop resilience so that they can face future crises, which means they should retain the capacity to switch to online operations even if only in emergencies. And I'm sure we'll discuss whether it will go beyond that. And of course, as you've said, Sandra, it's essential that if there is use of online learning, that students consider that what they're getting is at least satisfactory. So I'm going to present an analogy of what I believe makes online learning successful for students. And I ask you to think of this analogy as the student in online learning sitting on a three-legged stool. Now, and that stool, the three of its legs 
our student support, both synchronous and asynchronous, good learning materials, and efficient administration and logistics. Now, of course, a three-legged stool requires all three legs to support its weight. So by analogy, online learning will only work properly for students if each of these three legs is strong and can support the weight. If they're not, then the student will fall or in academic terms will fail. Now, I think it's true to say that in this year's rapid transition to online learning, most effort was involved in preparing learning materials, usually putting lectures online synchronously. And of course, good learning materials are vital to distance learning. It's important to remember, too, that it's, it, it, it's just as important to have asynchronous materials that students can study when they like, as well as synchronous lectures with the professor. But today, I'm going to concentrate on the other two legs of the stool, because I think they're sometimes forgotten. During the scramble to go online in the early years of, of this, uh, the early months of this year, I was able to observe a small higher education institution here in Vancouver, the Accenda School of Management, make this transition. And I was surprised and pleased by how successful it was. Now, of course, there was a lot of online teaching, but I think why Accenda was successful was because it put a very strong emphasis on student support and on administration and logistics. So let me start with the leg of student support. I think it's helpful to distinguish three areas where student support is needed. Of course, to be successful, students need to engage with the academic content of their courses. And many require more help than they will get in their formal online classes. So their first need is to be able to ask questions and to be challenged about their understanding of the concepts. And this can be done by the instructor themselves in group or one-to-one -one sessions. But I believe that if the class is large, this is best done by hiring special part-time people who can be trained for this special support function. The second area is administration. When students are on campus, they can usually solve their administrative questions by finding a professor and going to talk to them. But when everyone is off campus, this support has to be provided through clear information on websites, a friendly helpline, regular email updates, and quick and accurate replies to a large volume of email. Then there is cultural support. Undergraduate students in particular look to their campus for exciting cultural activities and the opportunities to meet other students. Now on campus, these usually happen informally, but once you're operating online, the HGI has to organize them, which means using technology to offer events like trivia quizzes, music nights, and so on, and debates. At Accenda, we found that the student ambassadors, who are senior students um, selected for their uh, extrovert qualities, also organized some very successful cultural events. And one of the striking things about the whole process was how important these um, student ambassadors became so that they were almost integrated into the student services function. And finally, there is uh, social support. Online study and confinement during lockdowns can be lonely, particularly for new students. They need opportunities to meet each other, even if only virtually, 
and to talk about personal issues that worry them. And each HEI has to decide where to draw the line between providing social support itself and making referrals to official psychological and counselling services that some countries provide through the state or through voluntary organisations. But I think HEI should be careful about taking responsibility for student issues that actually should properly be dealt with by the, by the state social services or even by the police. Let me now talk about the third leg of administration and logistics. Now, of course, much of this will be done by the learning management system. And Accenda trained its faculty to use both Zoom and Big Blue Button. It was good to have two options because, as you all know, in the early days of crashing into online learning, there was so much pressure on all these platforms from higher education institutions around the world that they did indeed often crash. In the end, we found that the Accenda teachers preferred Zoom, but it was good to have um, the other system as a backup. Effective online operations also depend on having an effective registry and student management policies that have been translated into smoothly operating procedures. This means user-friendly IT systems and telephone helplines so that students can get a human to deal with problems that they want to discuss with a real person. And of course, as you all found, the use of email will explode and the institution has to be ready to cope with that. So, in conclusion, I leave you with this analogy of a three-legged stool. My focus has been on the two legs of student support and logistics, but I expect my colleagues, Professors Divjak and Tushera will say more about learning materials. It's been a pleasure to work with Eden again, and I wish you all well as you move into the new normal, wherever you are and whatever that is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sir John. Uh, really a good point of how to support students. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Alison Morris Rowe from the European University Association, who is asking a uh, question, although online services are widely available, oh, sorry, uh, is there any way of knowing if they are truly fit for purpose for all students? I think the, the only way of knowing is to see how the students respond. Um, certainly in the experience at Accenda, I think we found out fairly quickly uh, what was needed and, and what was missing. Um, because one of the, um, if you like, one of the advantages of online for students and one of perhaps the disadvantages for the institution is that students can make their feelings felt much more quickly and share those impressions with other students so that everyone knows what is going on. I remember in the early, in the 90s, when we were moving the Open University UK online, um, and we were trying to persuade students that they should embark on this, one of the things we did was to equip the members of the student executive with computers at home so that they could get online. Now, this was kind of a good idea, but it came back to bite us because the students could bring together all the complaints that other students had um, very quickly and present them very forcefully. And since at that time we had about 150,000 students, you could not ignore what they were telling you was, was wrong with the system. So I, I, I do think one needn't worry too much about getting adequate feedback from students in an online environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wish to move on, but uh, in the meantime, please look at the question and answer session. There are questions there, so you can also answer some questions in writing. We will go to, uh, back to these questions later as well, but I would like now to move to our next speaker, to Antonio Teixeira. So, Antonio, please share with us your introductory presentation. 
Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Sandra. And uh, well, uh, I would like to start by thanking the, the kind invitation by Eden. It's always a pleasure to be here with, and to share my ideas with, uh, with all the community. And of course, a, a, a special uh, word also uh, for acknowledgement to my dear friend, well, uh, panel, panelists, uh, uh, Blajan and Sarjan. And I, I hope this will be uh, meaningful for, for the ones who are following us. I'm going now to share the, the, the slides. Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, the topic. Uh, the topic that I chose is a little bit um, um, following the, the same lines as has already been um, uh, the presentation by Sir John. Um, my uh, focus here will be slightly different, however, in terms of uh, what what are the main aspects um, uh, to be considered at this point? So uh, the the topic that I'm suggesting is universities going online. What are they ready uh, at this point for the challenge challenges of the new normal or um, the normal that uh, we are now facing? Um, this has already well. This is what happened uh, in the start of the year, and this is most probably what will happen again. And this is my first point here. Um, uh, I believe that has been uh, the, the, the management of communication, especially by the, by the politicians worldwide, has been very much in the sense of, uh, well, this is a, a situation that will be, uh, that will be um, overcoming soon and quite easily, or more or less easily, and this will not happen again. Well, uh, the, the first thing that probably we need to take into consideration when we're talking about uh, planning uh, in terms of uh, well being the higher education sector or the other educational sectors as well is that well we need to be prepared not only for the repetition of this but for new emergency situations that uh, can, may come along in the future and as we've been uh, clearly understanding from this example um, we are not ready for them so um, as Sir John has already pointed out uh, universities has to have to be better uh, prepared for uh, unknown emergencies. And we have to prepare for that, not just the institution, but also our own frame of mind. So this will most probably happen again, not necessarily uh, probably in the same way, but some of the, the phenomena will be repeated. And uh, this, of course, has uh, uh, led to universities taking, and Cambridge in Europe, Cambridge was the first one to take this decision to, um, to go fully online. Uh, for the next academic uh, uh, year. There's also something that I would like to point out regarding the, um, uh, the management of communication and uh, special political communication from uh, what has happened so far, is that there was a kind of a sense generated in many countries that uh, going online was a kind of a, well, um, uh, contingency that would uh, be uh, that we, we, the best thing would be to try to avoid. So in the sense that uh, online learning was not the real thing, uh, it's not the, the, the um, actually what we should be hoping for. Uh, uh, of course, what should be uh, clear for us, and this is a message that I believe institutions should repeat, uh, is that online education can be very effective, can be very successful, but depending on uh, the way that is, uh, the practices is, is planned and executed. So of course, if we do it in the right way, online learning can be as uh, effective and as successful uh, as any other form of, uh, of learning. Uh, of course, we need also to face uh, an issue is that um, all the, the, the models that we have, the theory that we have, developed the practices and the experience that we have um, uh, carried out throughout the years have not prepared enough for um, dealing with the uh, uh, learning situations uh, related to um, child, uh, well, to children or uh, at early ages and uh, so younger uh, students. But at, uh, higher education, at the higher education level, we, uh, we should be ready, uh, better uh, prepared in that sense. Um, so in this, uh, well, in this frame of mind, uh, we should be clear that when we're talking about uh, universities going online, is not some something of a, well um, contingency that uh, is uh, representing a kind of a, a going back in terms of quality. But on the other hand, it could be 
an improvement in, in the uh, learning quality, the, the quality of learning that institutions are providing. But in order for this uh, um, transition and this transformation uh, to be successful, it's not just a question of methodologies and, and procedures. It also has to imply, as I was trying to uh, point out, a transformation in the teaching and learning cultures. Another thing that we should also face is that m most of the experience that we've had accumulated over the years and assures high de uh, degree of quality in terms of uh, online learning uh, was designed in, um, in environments which are uh, social environments which, which are a little bit different from the ones that we are now facing. Even for the experienced universities, uh, online universities, uh, we are now dealing with students that are at home uh, in, in, in their uh, homes, they don't have enough uh, conditions to be the entire family working together using the same computer sometimes. And so this is a, a, um, a kind of a additional stress that we were not prepared for and we need to take into consideration in revising our own practices and uh, models as well. But going online is basically to do what this uh, suggests, this uh, model from the from GIST that was developed in GIST in the UK, is to actually um, to design the, the transformation of the learning experience based on the digital experience that our own students and our teachers, teaching staff and administrators have already had. So it's a continuation, it's a continuum, it's not something entirely different. And so we are already working and living online, we should be learning online. This is a, a very simple uh, um, step that has to be done in this sense. Are our universities ready for this? Well, this is the European Framework for Digital Content Education Organizations. Um, and this is a good um, model in the sense that it gathers, well, it brings together the main aspects that should be taken into consideration from the management and governance, governance model to the, the training of teachers to the content and curricula and all of this. Uh, as you will be, um, I'm sure that we'll be having access to the slides later on. I will not get into detail. At, at this stage, but this is a very uh, important uh, model to take into consideration, measuring in order to measure your own um, uh, contents in terms of the, the organization uh, readiness for the digital learning. But uh, one important aspect as well that governments have been stressing out, at least some governments in Europe, is that most of our uh, programs and our uh, courses are now being delivered online when they were not accredited uh, to work online, to be delivered online. And this is something that we have to take into consideration from a management point of view and also from um, uh, the, the perspective uh, of, um, of, the, uh, of the staff, of the scholars. Um, of course, we have to take into consideration the aspects that are critical in terms of quality assurance for online learning. Of course, this, uh, well, uh, on, on the left, you find uh, a good uh, model. It's just a model from the UBC in Canada. Uh, well, I leave it to such on to, uh, to actually uh, discuss it further, if you will. But on, on, um, on the second, uh, or on the right, you'll find um, kind of a um, reference to uh, what is the, the European model uh, that is um, settled, uh, that was designed by ENCO. Uh, the, the European um, Quality Assurance Agency, uh, well, association that, of course, governs the, the old national quality assurance agencies. From the older standards that you have here, and these are the typical standards for uh, um, evaluating co uh, programs in Europe, these are the four. Uh, this is a work that has been developed by Esther Huertas from the Catalan, uh, um, well, a group that was led by her from the Catalan Quality Assurance Agency, these four are absolutely uh, essential. Um, the change in the policy for quality assurance, this, uh, the, the, the aspects related to the standard of student standard learning and teaching uh, um, uh, methodology in this sense. Of course, uh, the, also the, the training of the teacher staff and the preparation and support of the teaching staff and the learning resources and student support has already been uh, stressed by such a. Uh, well, this gives you a more uh, well kind of a breakthrough of the standards and not have to be particular uh, taken particularly in, into consideration. I'll just sp uh, skip, given the limitations in time, uh, to this um, kind of summing up. Uh, first of all, I would recommend to adjust the governance and leadership model of the institution to an educational innovation framework. This is absolutely essential. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work. Uh, it's just a kind of a, 
um, adoption of techniques, of uh, resources, but it's not a transformation of the institution. Also, the opening up of the educational ecosystem, meaning here not only uh, the learning environment, uh, so the technological uh, side, but also the pedagogical design, uh, but as uh, John was also uh, pointing out, also the process of giving uh, of all the administrative uh, structure uh, and uh, financial and so on to, uh, to make this transition as well. Uh, many universities, already, uh, even if they provide uh, online learning, uh, their own in in internal structure is not uh, working online. So this is something that has to be uh, taken in consideration. It's not uh, an easy thing to do. Of course, I'll, I'll uh, well focus uh, a lot on, on the importance of uh, implementing open education, uh, an open educational resources um, uh, philosophy. This is quite important. Of course, uh, the other aspects are already um, mentioned there. I would also um, stress the importance, of the importance of developing an online pedagogy, starting with the uh, uh, adoption of a reference model for teaching and learning in your institution that could be helpful as a, uh, a to, uh, to, in a way, serve as a guidance for the, the, the teachers um, and the, well, the, the faculty to make this transition and also for the students to understand what is the model, what is implied, what is uh, expected of them, how can they actually uh, co-manage um, co the, the learning process and uh, also the other two uh, aspects, promoting curriculum development innovation, openness, op flexibility, personalization, of course, the issues li uh, linked with um, accessibility has already uh, have already been mentioned, and digital inclusion. This is something that is now uh, seen from uh, with different eyes regarding this uh, experience because we thought that digital inclusion was very much now focused on accessibility, not as much on social uh, digital inclusion. But now we we have seen that it's it's the opposite. It's social digital inclusion that have to take probably even into more uh, into consideration. And of course, a change in the uh, in the um, this kind of move to a participatory or mainly participatory learning culture. Uh, and a, a very important aspect that has been uh, also um, one of the lessons learned from this experience has been the importance of e-assessment or uh, online assessment. Uh, online assessment can be uh, reliable, but what has also to be uh, understood is that we have to change the methods that we are using and not organizing assessment in the same way that we are just uh, doing it in a conventional way, basically, basically uh, mostly in exams. Well, but the, the probably the most important factor uh, of all these, well, with the students and the learners, is, uh, of course, the preparation of the teacher staff, the faculty, and how the, the, they can uh, be trained, best trained for this new um, um, scenario. Uh, well, this is the digital competencies uh, framework uh, for educators that is quite known. This is a very useful um, uh, reference um, model. And of course, this is the same, uh, um, but uh, well, presenting in a different way. As you can see here, uh, the, the, um, the preparation, the uh, training of teachers have to be, uh, um, well, designed in a more holistic way. If, if not just the teaching and learning, so the, the expert, uh, aspects related with the teaching, with the guidance, with um, with a more focus on collaborative learning, uh, but also the, the issues rega regarding with the, how to uh, produce, reuse, to use, reuse, to remix, to, to produce visual resources, especially on an open um, context. Uh, well, it's also uh, assessment, uh, also empowering learners. Well. All of these aspects have to be taken into consideration. And so to sum up and to finalize, because <laughs> I'm uh, challenged by time as well, these are the challenges that I believe are more important at this stage for digital, digital professional development. First of all, to redesign the models in order to increase uh, the focus on training for innovation and this rapid change. Uh, teachers have to be more ready than ever to, uh, to ex exercise their practice in unfamiliar settings for which they were not trained before. Also, uh, to introduce immersive online-based training practices. It, it's no use, and there has been a clear lesson learned. It's, it makes, it's not useful to train teachers uh, as online uh, teachers if we're, doing, if we're doing it in a, a conventional setting. If they do not experience previously, uh, priorly, um, uh, how, what is the experience of learning online, they cannot teach online uh, because they cannot understand 
in the best way, how to manage time, the importance of communication, how does it affect it, uh, all of these um, lurking, all, all of these uh, aspects that are very important uh, to manage, of course, uh, the cultural experience of online learning uh, have to be first uh, experienced by the teachers uh, in order for them to be prepared to uh, act as teachers afterwards, digital teachers afterwards, or online teachers in this sense. Of course, the use of digital resources in authentic contexts, this is clearly becoming ever more important. Of course, uh, promoting flexibility and personalization of learning, the participation of, of learners and students in this sense, in co-designing their own learning uh, paths, uh, uh, their own learning processes, introduction, of course, the new assessment models and new forms of uh, certification, I um, already talked about uh, uh, the preparation for uh, to work in fully open learning environments. Very importantly, this has been also a lesson learned to raise awareness for task overload and digital fatigue. It has been clearly a problem in the in the first half of the year, and of course, uh, a large integration of non formal learning. Um, these are probably the the most important aspects. I would say are the main challenges for uh, digital digital professional development at this stage. Well, I'll leave you just with a couple of resources. This is a, these are very uh, well known and could be very helpful. Well, this is an example of how we at the Open University of Portugal also uh, um, look at uh, teacher um, training uh, while um, designing it in the form of a MOOC. So this could be uh, shared and could be, uh, the experiences itself could be um, generating uh, new knowledge in uh, an open environment. Well, and thank you very much. And well, back to you, uh, Sandra. Thank you, Antonio. Very interesting. We could talk long for a long time about topics and issues you have pointed out here. Uh, just a brief question from you. Uh, you will look for the other questions in the question and answer session. So, which one uh, for the First one is from James Rutherford. Do you have models or examples that demonstrate this transformation of learning and teaching cultures? It was from the beginning of your uh, presentation. Well, um, well, there are some. Uh, well, there we cannot say that there are models in this in the well, traditional sense, uh, theoretical models in this sense. Of course, there are theoretical approaches that can be useful. Uh, but they are very good examples that uh, institutions that have managed to do so. Well, so John has just mentioned one. I could also mention the experience of the Open University when it made the transition some 10 years ago. Uh, there are other um, uh, very interesting stories that can be shared. Um, and I believe this is probably more useful at this point, more than just uh, to uh, give you uh, theoretical models, to, uh, to share with you uh, best practices of how this has been uh, done. The more the most important topic, I would say, is to uh, involve the entire institution, well, in, in a holistic perspective, to involve the entire institution in the changing process that is basically a cultural process, more than just a technical process or a change in methods. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. We will uh, continue with discussion later, so please look at the questions uh, and question and answer session. And now uh, I will move to Blazenka for her introductionary presentation so that we get her point of view. As a former minister, she is very much acquainted with the situation at universities and have first-hand experience when chairing the by creation uh, presidency of EU. Uh, so, Blazinka, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm really happy that um, I can participate. And first of all, that you invited me to this uh, panel. And uh, I would like to also thank to the participants to join us, to share with us, and especially to Sir John and Antonio for a, a very interesting uh, presentations, the first two presentations. And now I'm uh, curious if you can learn something more from me after their presentation. Yes, you're right that um, during the, um, uh, the first half of this year when I was uh, chairing the um, uh, EU uh, Education and Research Minister, uh, Minister's Council, there were a lot of, um, actually the, 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 the topic, the only topic was COVID-19 and how the educational systems are um, actually adjusting and how they are dealing with uh, this new challenge. But we also learn uh, from that uh, that case 
that we are really stronger together if we are working together, if we are sharing and if we, uh, if we are open, um, at least at the European Union level. And it was really surprising for some of the, some, some of the people there. And that is the, one of the reasons why I um, entitled my um, uh, presentation today, uh, let's size the opportunity, let's size the opportunity, let's see how, what we can learn from uh, this situation. So uh, because of the um, uh, COVID-19, we, of course, we, uh, we experienced um, uh, challenges uh, and uh, for the education system or systems all around the world. There were a lot of improvisations, uh, delayed responses, sometimes even chaotic behavior, like uh, Brown, uh, Brownian uh, <laughs> movements. But also at the same time, uh, what we experience um, is the strengths of education uh, systems, innovation capacity of teachers, resilience of students, support of parents, especially in pre-tertiary education. Uh, and uh, that's the, the reason I, I'm really hoping that we learned uh, a lot from uh, from from this uh, first phase, and um, uh, we also had a and uh, certainly a massive evidence of rapid digital transformation of higher education institutions. So it, it's not just introduction of new methods of teaching and learning, but also assessment methods. But uh, also um, what we um, probably are not um, still. Um, um, research it is a, a student development of new skills because all um, all the time what uh, our people are discussing and still uh, have been discussing it is about what kind of the skills and knowledge the students uh, are missing because of the pandemics and digital uh, digital education and so on but very rarely we can hear about um, the students actually developed a lot of new skills that couldn't be developed without the situation we were pushed into, like problem solving, but also metacognitive skills, uh, the knowledge and uh, experience about their own progress, then taking uh, responsibility for their progress, then um, independent learning, research, uh, decision, make, uh, decision making on a daily basis. So this is uh, really a huge, um, uh, playground for researchers to discover what kind of a new skills students uh, students have developed. Of course, when we talk about um, uh, teaching and learning, uh, let us embrace the new teaching and learning methods because uh, these um, uh, all of these challenges there are opportunities for us. I remember when we uh, started twenty years ago. Um, the, with the Bologna reform in uh, in Europe, there were a lot of um, uh, a lot of discussion about the changing structure structure of uh, for achieving certain degrees levels and so on. But um, what uh, the the best institutions nowadays then actually um, uh, caught that they should uh, rediscover their own identity. Um, about the uh, teaching and learning uh, learning practices. And what Antonio said before is, it is about transformation of teaching and learning culture. So it is a time to analyze it, to pose a pro problem, so, um, and to solve uh, problems, to have a kind of a situation analysis, and also to show our students that we know how to do it, how to uh, analyze, how to pose a problem, and also how to provide some solutions of the problems. So this out of the box uh, thinking, and also thinking about grassroots initiatives we have all around our educational system since it is really an um, opportunity for us to, to do so. Of course, we can, um, uh, we can, um, we have to be aware. I think that all of us certainly are aware that, um, it's necessary first to choose a good methodological approach and then to consider the appropriate technology to support it. Of course, in this emergency reaction uh, in the first half of this year was uh, a little bit, as I said, chaotic, but now for the next academic year, we should be really aware that we should, first of all, um, 
need to uh, consider methodological, pedagogical um, approach, and then uh, then technology as a second. And um, as basic indicators of quality of teaching and uh, teaching and learning, so it is invariant of teaching online, online or face-to-face uh, -face teaching. I um, I would single out. Um, three indicators one uh, three groups of indicators sets of indicators uh, uh, first one achievement of learning outcomes indicators then interaction indicators and then satisfaction of motivation indicators and sir john already said that this interaction is something that we sh really should um, um, uh, really should consider and in different uh, different environments and put a lot of effort to have the, all these interactions students materials student student and teacher uh, teacher student or student teacher um, and we, we should uh, really think about our practices um, considering at least these three sets of indicators um, i choose here to uh, single out uh, flip classroom because uh, it's very exciting even though not very uh, not a, not entirely new concept of teaching, and ha I have been using uh, um, uh, occasionally since 2014. But uh, due to the pre uh, uh, prevalence of uh, online teaching, I think it's very important to again to stress out how uh, how we can use flipped classroom and ena that enables different types of interactions even in online environment, as I mentioned before, also to engage students, uh, to support students as, as independent uh, learners and also researchers. Yes, um, as, as you know, and um, uh, some of you also experienced, there are a lot more work for teachers when preparing this kind of um, 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 sophisticated uh, learning environment than just have a um, delivery of material or um, some traditional traditional uh, methods, but it's it's worth uh, worth it. But I also would like to stress um, because of this enormous amount of effort and um, um, preparation you should put into the uh, flipped classroom um, approach. Uh, it is really very, uh, very good to share, to really use education, open educational material, as Antonio mentioned before. So I think that we can uh, re really learn from that a lot. And then uh, let me uh, let me go back to uh, another topic that uh, Antonio mentioned. Uh, it is about uh, assessment methods, because we, all of us know that um, it's very important how we assess students because students students usually learn uh, what they need for for assessment and uh, as Noel and Vistel said, um, assessment guides learning, and uh, it is it is not um, uh, something that we can practice that we just okay so we 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 are very much on problem solving critical thinking and then when we assess them we just ask them some routine task to uh, to perform or just to copy what we said on uh, different presentations and and lecturing so it is it is really important that we ask ourselves uh, uh, again uh, which is essential for students to know, uh, to know, or to be able to do in my course, in my study program, and to answer it honestly, and then to put that really in these learning outcomes we are we are very fond of. But when we think about it, we we should really have a, a much broader approach in a way to to see what is relevant on a long run. Uh, what is essential for their um, profession, uh, and also to use authentic examples and tasks whenever we can, and ask from them to have this deep approach to learning. So I, uh, I uh, coined this read acronym for that, but all this, uh, in my opinion, should be covered. And it's invariant of the main media. It can be used online or it can be used um, uh, face to face. And uh, as I said, uh, to be aware of this implicit knowledge I mentioned before. Of course, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for formative assessment, use of peer and self-assessment to, to boost these uh, metacognitive skills of our students. 
And um, of course, um, uh, during my um, uh, mandate as a minister, there were a lot of questions about how to prevent cheating, how to have um, um, assessments that are um, uh, reliable. And um, of course, um, th there is no unique answer, but in general, there is a balance. If you, ha if you have a routine tasks, then you should really use much more control and uh, uh, new methods uh, how to perform, especially e-assessment, even though, of course, you can use uh, banks, banks, huge banks of, with questions and so on, but still there is a need for more control. But if you have a, com a complex, this read task, then uh, it needs less control, more fun for students, but more time spent on preparation for, for teachers as well, as I said before. And then the, my last, uh, last slide here, it is some general slide on a digital transformation of higher education, because we really experience that it can be done, but it should be done having in mind the goals and also the proper methods and lessons learned. And uh, again, to, uh, sizing the opportunity for a complete makeover. It's not just how we can uh, prepare ourselves for the next emergency, but how we can uh, really uh, analyze situation and um, learn from that about the teaching and learning, supporting uh, students and, and teachers as well. And is a, a really a big opportunity for new players. So emerging universities for the future, uh, because the cards actually are, are shuffled again uh, on a basis of um, uh, which university is, um, let's say, much more uh, vivid, much more resilient and much more eager to change and to change in a way to not to, to lower the quality, but really to enhance the quality with a, with a new means. So acceptance of grassroots uh, initiatives, experimentations and co-creation of new learning environment. So this uh, hybrid learning as a new normal for all, integrated, so face-to-face -face and all, uh, online learning, the best from both worlds. Of course, those who are entirely online is different, but let's say that uh, uh, for traditional universities, it's really a very strong um, push for, uh, for, for, for change. And uh, of course, um, uh, uh, the last but not the least, better accessibility and um, for all students and uh, equity can be provided uh, having all this in mind. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer your question if there are any. Thank you, Bajinka. Uh, number of topics which are very, very important and uh, very interesting uh, at this moment. Just looking at the questions, maybe one to comment uh, more, more to, for a comment uh, than actually giving reply. Uh, online and in-person are very different and there it is not obvious that online is as good as in-person. We need to be very cautious about differences and not to assume it's all the same. This would ignore the fact that education is very heterogeneous field of work with different, very different values. What would be your comment uh, on this uh, uh, statement? Yeah, I, I would say that there is no one answer for all. So uh, there's, there's a reason why it's very difficult to, to provide um, uh, to provide with a one model or one approach. But uh, I really believe that when we are talking about traditional universities, that they can use this face-to-face uh, -face component for um, uh, for strength and those activities and. Um, uh, those, uh, let's say, uh, social interactions that are very meaningful, but at the same time to move online and use the um, online tools and digital tools for enhancement uh, of the, um, let's say, um, um, teaching and learning, uh, um, let's say, uh, material interactions, peer assessment, and so on. So there is no one solution for all. And that's the reason I said it is really a time to size the opportunity to rethink our, our practices that we are using. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to open discussion. Uh, we have some questions uh, in our question and answer session. Um, we, most of them are focused on accessibility uh, of students to technology, also teachers. 
uh, as well as how to uh, make the online learning uh, effective because uh, it, it's, it's not always equally effective for all students. And uh, do a, it's a question for all of you as a panelist. Are you concerned about cascading effects of this worldwide shift to online learning for students for whom online may not be a good fit? So maybe, Sir John, what would be your comment on this? Well, I think early on we've all been talking about resilience and clearly looking forward, if online is going to be a major component of education systems, there is a lot of responsibility, it seems to me, on governments at least to provide um, networks throughout their countries that people can, can readily access. So that's the first part of it. Um, and of course, in uh, some countries which don't have that, there are actually some very intelligent solutions being developed by people like the Commonwealth of Learning for local systems that can provide the equivalent of the internet over, over a short range. But I think it's a very difficult, much more difficult question, who equips people with the equipment to work from home? Um, some universities are rich enough to do that, most are not. Um, but I think as we go forward out of the pandemic, the whole of societies will realise that access to online and digital things, not just for teaching, but for all kinds of things, is, is a much more important thing that governments and everyone else has to, has to look at. Uh, the second point I'd make is that uh, it's clear that uh, online is not for everyone. Um, and I personally believe that um, while the experience this year has showed that it works very well in many cases at the university level. Uh, it certainly doesn't work half as well at school level. In fact, I don't think it works at all at uh, elementary level. At secondary level, it's a bit more nuanced, but um, we've been having the most terrific debates here in British Columbia about whether the kids should go back to school and risk getting infected or or um, should stay online. And what's been very interesting to me is that our public health authorities, the people who said, we think it very important that children go back to school because so many things happen in school that are important for the development. And, and we, the public health people, are prepared to take what we think, at least in the case in British Columbia, is a rather small risk of infections and COVID spreading and so on, because we think it's much more important that the kids get back into face-to-face -face teaching situations. But as I said, I don't think that applies at university level. So that's a different question. Thank you, Sir John. Um, can I just make, a, can you Mr., uh, make an additional comment on this? Yeah, of course, Antonio, please. Yes, well, I've also replied um, in, uh, to this question in the Q&A. And, and following up on, uh, on what Sir John has, has said, uh, well, I have a slight um, difference in a sense uh, or, or regarding this. Um, of course, it, it is absolutely right in, in the comment that is made, of course, from a, an objective uh, point of view. What I believe also is that we are um, answering the question based on the current uh, reality and not on the possibilities of changing of the, the reality itself. Mm -hmm. Because basically when we look at um, uh, the, um, uh, the non-university sectors, of course starting by early childhood, which is, has, is, is quite challenging because we don't have even much um, theoretical models to work with uh, from the perspective of online learning. There hasn't been much uh, um, um, expertise producing on this. So we cannot have, have much on, on, on that regard. But I believe that research will be focusing now on, from, on this as well. And so we'll be changing and we'll acquire a lot of expertise that we don't have at this stage, but it will be developing in, in the coming years. So my difference regarding the perspective of Sir John is that, okay, I agree with him on what he said, but we also should uh, take um, uh, convey a positive message in the sense that it's also the responsibility of our own community's research effort to change some of those conditions. Regarding the accessibility, of course, I also agree with Sir John in the sense that it's not just the, the uh, responsibility of governments. And we have seen that a lot of investment has been done in terms of infrastructure in the first, um, year, uh, first decade of this uh, century. And apparently it was not 
as successful as we thought it was. Uh, and so, um, of course, there's need to be a, a, a larger uh, investment in terms of, a sex, of creating a, a, um, conditions for people to have access to internet, but also to invest a lot, even more now, on training uh, teachers and also on changing the institutions in order for them to be able to uh, meet those, those uh, requirements that are not meeting at this point. Uh, well, this is just something uh, yeah. I wanted to, to stress. Just to ask you a question, you said uh, the, the training for teachers, it's very important. And, and my question to you would be, who is, uh, who should be in charge to organize such training for teachers? Are these teachers by themselves, institution, government, who should take care about this? Because definitely it's a question of training teachers to be able to teach in new environment. Yeah, uh, well, um, I believe that is um, a sh should be a shared um, responsibility. Of course, governments need uh, to play their role here because the effort is is um, is multi institutional in the sense that it, it, it's global, and so it, it it requires also the adaptation of the legal frameworks of how the, their uh, teacher's career is organized for professional development. So. It's much more than just uh, allowing them to have a, a kind of a brief <laughs> a training course. So uh, in this sense, I think that it should start by governments, possibly in Europe, even with some in, um, intervention by the European Commission as a kind of uh, umbrella organization. Uh, and also uh, because funding is required for this. Um, well, a lot of funding. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, it should be also the responsibility of their institutions uh, themselves. Um, in some cases, as for instance, uh, we're talking about universities. Uh, when we're talking about the other education sectors, of course, the involvement of uh, city halls and uh, re regional and local authorities is also quite important. Uh, uh, at the university level, I believe universities uh, are more autonomous in that sense and should have a, uh, should play a, a larger role. Of course, in organizations as ours, as Eden and others. Uh, should also play an important role in sharing the experiences, uh, sharing the expertise, and providing resources uh, at that sense as well. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, I will now continue with this question, the, the first one which uh, Sir John started with answering to Blazenka. Uh, you were uh, able to uh, prepare the action plan there actually for uh, inst education institutions for the autumn uh, for the new academic and school year and taking into account that maybe uh, online is not fit for all and uh, a hybrid model uh, as such, not all people think it's also uh, so good. What, what was your idea how to organize, how to propose to organize uh, uh, teaching and learning in, in universities and in schools? Thank you for asking that, Sandra. Uh, actually, uh, I think that the first, um, um, uh, at first in uh, in spring when we started online, it was the only um, uh, the only criteria we uh, took into consideration was uh, pandemic, nothing else. But uh, now we should consider at least uh, two sets of criteria: those that are um, connected to the health issues but also those that are um, connected to the conditions that different universities and schools have. So the action plan was proposed like uh, that we should really take into consideration both. So conditions, so it means um, not just uh, buildings, and, but also human resources, materials, equipment for students and so on. So, um, I, I agree with Antonio that it is much more, um, let's say, much more responsibility when you are minister to organize the school teaching and learning than the university because uh, you're always in trouble when you try to interfere with um, autonomy and university universities, except when universities are asking for more funding, then you are really welcome to interfere as a, as a government. <laughs> but uh, let me say that um, uh, what we try to do it is to take care about uh, all three components. So we said uh, it depends on the situation. 
we try to have as much as we can um, uh, in physical environment, especially for schools. It doesn't mean universities are different, but for schools as much as we can. Then we should, um, uh, if the conditions are such that we should use the blended learning in schools or uh, at the universities, we should provide in three areas. First of all, it is um, uh, about the equipment. So to provide some additional funding for students and pupils to uh, for, for pupils in schools actually to um, we, um, um, uh, we bought quite a big amount of uh, laptops and um, uh, also, um, also also tablets and for teachers as well. At the university, we try to uh, to uh, to motivate and even support universities to rent equipment. To, to students, not to force them to buy it, but to, to rent them. Um, and then the second is education. So additional training for students and for teachers, uh, regardless of the model we are going to use, it, it's good to uh, to have this, edu uh, this training as we, we learned before, not just about how to use technology, but how to use technology for learning and especially to use it uh, uh, with a certain goals and purposes I talked about. So this is the, the, the second and the third is strategic uh, approach to that. So it means uh, to empower schools and uh, universities to, be, uh, to have a really good tools for strategic decision making and also to use agile, lean uh, approach to decision making and strategic planning, not to, to have a long processes with uh, uh, a lot of um, actors and very deep um, uh, and very complicated structure, but to have a, a agile one. So I think that's, um, I try to, uh, to answer it as, 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 as fast as I can, but you can find even on a um, uh, Ministry of Science and Education English page, you can find uh, the, the, the whole document in English. So you can, you can probably find some other answers I, I haven't provided so far. Thank you. Um, we are going uh, quite uh, with our time. Uh, we have already uh, passed uh, an hour, so I will try to summarize, to make us summarize and, and, and try to conclude uh, uh, the session. So uh, for each of you, <coughs> I would like to ask you uh, if you were uh, to give a short answer to the questions when we are talking about digital transformation of universities. Uh, what do you think? How much they are prepared today for digital transformation? Because uh, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to know that there are universities who had did who did already digital transformation. But I would say the majority of them are still in this process or are just starting with this process. And uh, what would be your first? Uh, what would be your recommendation for the first issue to think about? when doing digital transformation of the university. So Sir John, I hope it's not too difficult. No, it's interesting. One of the most exciting things I've been involved in in the last few months have been drop-in sessions for the faculty at this little Exenda School of Management here in Vancouver. Now these are part-time faculty. They teach at a number of institutions, but the vice president has convened drop-in sessions uh, every couple of weeks for them to exchange experience of doing what they've been doing. And I have been amazed by the quality of these and the richness of what has been exchanged. So that I think it's fair to say that most of the training that has taken place in this little management school has been actually uh, one faculty telling another faculty member what has been successful for them. And if you pool all their knowledge, they have a quite amazing knowledge of the technologies and all the rest of it. So I, I'm not sure this necessarily requires a sort of top-down government-led or even institution-led approach. Someone has to take the initiative, but I think uh, these people understand the way the world is going. They want to be part of it, and I think if you appeal to them, you'll get far more back than you expect. Thank you. Very good answer. Yes, we have to always count on people. Yeah, thank you. Antonio? 
Well, um, building up a little bit <laughs> on what has already been said, um, I believe that the, the, the key issue is um, to tell people, to be able to convince them that um, to uh, conduct this uh, um, digital transformation, digital transformation is also a way of uh, increasing the quality of the learning experience, the quality, the flexibility, uh, the efficiency of the learning experience. Um, uh, well, it might be, uh, it's interesting, I was just uh, uh, recollecting my own experience, what actually was used by us 10 years ago at the Open University of Portugal to convince the, the, the faculty uh, to do this transition was actually telling them that this would increase the quality of, of what they were doing. And they discovered it. Of course, another important as, and they were happy about it. Uh, some of them um, were not happy at first. And this is something that has to be taken into consideration when you're managing such a process. Uh, the, 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 the response will, will, you'll have the response in two, three, four years time. So uh, the, the first year or second, it will be hard. And many will react because people don't like to change, opposite to what is common knowledge. <laughs> now, people don't like to change. And so um, the importance uh, here is to uh, show what they can watch each one of them the students, the the, the teaching, the teachers, the, the well, what everyone involved, families and so on, the community is is able to gain from this process. And I would just reinforce this message that um, uh, making the, this uh, transition to online learning is not a, a way to decrease the quality of the, the, of the learning that is provided, but actually should be the opposite, should be in a way to increase that quality. And also the possibility of personalization, adjustment, flexibility, and each one will have a different experience from the, the, the other one, uh, but a meaningful experience. Um, so that would be in short <laughs> my message. Thank you, thank you, and Bajinka. From your point of view, so, thank you. I think that we certainly are much more prepared today than, than we were a year ago. But it was not by because we decided so, but uh, because it ha just happened. But now uh, we um, we can react uh, in two different ways. First, first, what I really strongly recommend: let us size the opportunity, especially for newcomers, new institutions, teachers that probably. Uh, haven't considered their uh, teaching and learning uh, practices properly in the past, but now it is opportunity to size the uh, to this new uh, new push. But at the same time, I think there is another way, uh, another behavior we can uh, we can see around. It's kind of a reaction, like let us just close our eyes and uh, let us wait for all these pandemics and everything to, to stop. And then we are going back to our happy, uh, old, very comfortable way of uh, dealing with, with things. And unfortunately, uh, we have such, um, uh, such reactions for the top people from different systems, universities, and so on. And I think that is very, very... Um, uh, let's say dangerous answer and attitude and behavior nowadays. So what what I would like to emphasize: size the opportunity, try to find um, uh, co-creation principle in your institution, and open up, open up, because we are we are now. Uh, let's say in a position that we can say, yeah, it's difficult. We we should learn from each other. We are not perfect, but we are eager to learn. But show our students that we can really deal with the situation. That's actually learning by doing. Thank you. I think we we pointed out very good that uh, actually from what I have read in, uh, behind the, your your messages that uh, as ancient uh, as it is that. Uh, talking to people, you know, from generation to generation, but now from people to, to teacher or to other teacher or uh, a manager to other manager, a head a master to other head master is the most important thing because uh, by sharing the, these practices, uh, we actually learn a lot and uh, what was working uh, uh, in some other situation can also work well in our situation or we can adapt it for our situation. And I definitely... There's a lot of differences, but I'm certain that listening and sharing 
uh, the others, we can find the solutions, a way how to implement things into uh, our environment. Yes, we need technology, finances, and other issues, but I think with the goodwill uh, and openness uh, to, to new challenges and to embrace them, we will we can encounter uh, everything. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would also very much uh, enjoy that I can uh, wake up tomorrow and everything is going to be the same as before the pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, it's not going to happen. Otherwise, I would dream about every day to make me younger, you know, and go back uh, 20 years ago, but uh, it's not going to happen. So I would like to thank my speakers today, very good panelists for very good topics and uh, insights and advices. Uh, I'm certain that the participants uh, have uh, gained uh, quite good ideas. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, all our participants for being with us today from all over the world. And I would like to announce that next session on the same topic, but from different perspectives, will be, will be on the next Monday with different speakers. So please join us again. And also think about at the same time uh, how to uh, prepare the paper for the research workshop uh, in Lisbon. I think that the research is very important because based on research, we can um, have new methods, we, have new, we can have new insights and uh, new ways of working, which will enable us in the end to provide high quality teaching and learning, which is aim of us all. So thank you again and all the best. See you next Monday. Bye. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.